So welcome to Cracking Drupal. This is a uh, sort of, uh, it's in the PHP track. This is meant to be of uh, general interest to PHP developers, but it's definitely a developer talk. Uh, we'll show you some code samples, uh, but not, not too much in depth, but mostly focused on concepts and um, then also connecting it back to Drupal uh, and talking about how Drupal helps uh, prevent some of the most common uh, vulnerabilities we'll talk about and in which cases, you know, Drupal can't really help you um, and you need to do things right yourself. Um, Moj, assuming he shows up, and me are members of the Drupal security team. So I get to put on my official Drupal security team hat. <laughs> um, so we do these kind of presentations. Um, uh, so I've done this one actually with uh, Klaus uh, a couple times. Uh, he uh, handed it off to me and uh, Moj should do this time. Uh, but we do them to basically uh, help improve the general uh, state of security knowledge and um, improve you know, the overall security posture of Drupal code, especially contributed modules, since um, obviously contributed modules uh, get a lot less attention than Drupal core in terms of uh, people looking for security vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the other things you should know about the security team, uh, I think we'll mention it at the end, is that we don't actively look for problems. We basically handle things that are reported to us. Uh, so you should not imagine that we are proactively scanning your code at this point, but instead, usually it's another contributor. If there's a uh, you know, module on Drupal.org, so a contributor will notice there's a problem, report it to us, and then we work together with the maintainer to fix it, uh, as opposed to us being proactively looking for problems. Okay, so the overall kind of framework for the talk here is we're just going to talk about security strategies, um, and we're going to talk then, as I said, about uh, particularly about PHP and Drupal. Um, and overall, think about your security strategies. This is a big picture uh, for your website. Uh, so in terms of your website, any kind of application, you need to know who you trust and what you trust them to do. Um, so for example, do you trust your editors to reconfigure the site, enable modules? I hope not. Um, you should instead be thinking about how do I give the, the editors the least amount of privilege uh, that they need to do their jobs. And that's so this principle of trust, knowing who to trust to do what, uh, feeds in uh, to the principle of least privilege. Principle of trust is also very important about data that you're dealing with. Do you trust the data? And you'll see over and over again, these vulnerabilities basically come down to the case where you trust data that came from a user when you should not have trusted it because that user might be an attacker. Basically, user is synonymous with attacker. In most of the examples I'm showing you here, any user of your site could potentially be an attacker. Um, so you don't want to trust the data that came from the user. So don't trust the data. Figure out who you want to trust to do what. Uh, edit, audit your permissions. Set them up so you give people the least number of permissions they need to do their job. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in uh, depth later. Um, and then think about uh, defense in depth. So you don't want to have a, a single point of failure where if someone gets through that, they basically put the missile into the Death Star and it blows up. right? So you want to have, you know, if possible, in all, these, in all these different attack scenarios, you want to have some fallback, some possible mitigation, something that makes it not as bad as it might have been otherwise. Um, if you do that, if you have those layers of defense, then any single one of them failing doesn't mean a catastrophic failure. Um, this is a broad principle, um, not always possible, but something you should strive for. Um, and then one of the most important yet obvious things that people fail to do is just keep their software up to date. Uh, so if you're running a Drupal site, or if you're running a server, um, no matter even if you're running your laptop and you aren't updating your browser, uh, the browser software, all these things make you vulnerable to exploits uh, that are commonly known, and people automate those exploits. They will exploit you over and over again. They'll exploit all your sites. They will exploit everyone running the out-of-date browser. So the best way really you have as a normal human uh, to not be exploited is keep that software as up to date as you can in, in all the different layers, your laptop, your server, the web application running on top of the server, the database uh, server software, all those things have to be kept up to date um, you know, as quickly as you can when you see uh, security announcements come out. Uh, so the framework for this talk is gonna be the OWASP top 10. Um, people know about the OWASP project Good, some, uh, but not definitely not everyone, maybe a third. So this is a, a sort of open knowledge sharing project. Uh, it's called the Open Web Application Security Project. It focuses on PHP applications, and it strives to you know, disseminate sort of best practices, uh, information, and uh, lists the most critical security vulnerabilities and sort of their attack vectors. Um, and that 
list is called the OWASP top 10. So that's going to be the framework for this talk. But so I'm going to run through the top OWASP top 10 and show you how that relates to PHP code and Drupal in specific, uh, and then how you can avoid being a victim of one of those OWASP top 10. Uh, people also often say, basically, if you're a victim of one of these things, you weren't even really trying because it's the top 10. You know, if you fell victim to top 10, you, were, you, know, you weren't doing your job, you know, at least fall victim to number 11, something a little more obscure. <laughs> um, so they update this list every few years based on doing surveys of the, the PHP community, and they order them through a combination of frequency and severity. Um, so you'll see that the number one is not necessarily the most frequent, but is the most absolutely most severe, so the most important thing to avoid. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the frequency of these things within Drupal uh, as we go through them. So uh, OWASP top 10 number one. This is the thing you must avoid at all possible cost. <laughs> um, so they broadly term this injection. Um, and basically, injection means that the attacker uh, is able to send some data to your site, and that data is executed in some way as a programming language or as uh, SQL. Uh, so two obvious and distinct, slightly distinct things are SQL injection, right, where the attacker's uh, string is executed as SQL and runs a database query, uh, versus code execution, commonly called remote code execution, uh, where the attacker is in some way able to actually upload PHP code or cause PHP code to be executed. So these are both very bad. They basically both uh, will likely mean all the data on your site can be disclosed. The attacker may well be able to take over your site. Um, but they're relatively easy to avoid in the Drupal context. So if you look at this first example, so most of the code examples are sort of Drupal 7 style. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Drupal 8 also, but uh, just, you know, most people are still using Drupal 7. Uh, so here we see a typical database query. We're selecting some data. Hopefully you see what's wrong there. And what's wrong is we're taking user input. The user input is coming from the query string and directly concatenating it into the query, to the SQL query. This is like... You know, unfortunately, you see this more often than you should if you go look through contrib modules that something like this is happening. But this is extremely bad and very easy to avoid, right? So the easy way to avoid this is use the database placeholders. Just use the API correctly. You're going to avoid this. It's not a problem. Um, and those database placeholders, what they do is they escape that user input so that it cannot get out and be executed as an SQL statement on its own. So uh, the problem with this is that if someone can append to your SQL statement, they can select additional data uh, into the query, or depending on which version of Drupal and PHP and MySQL you're running, uh, they may be able to execute multiple SQL commands. And you may have remembered in 2014, there was a SQL injection vulnerability affecting Drupal 7 core, and people that were able to exploit that could basically write new rows in the user table. They could write uh, new cache entries. They could write new menu callbacks into the database. They could basically do anything they wanted to your site uh, and very quickly actually leverage it into remote code execution. They could basically turn that database exploit into executing whatever PHP code they wanted. Uh, and literally hundreds, maybe thousands of sites were compromised within you know, a day of that you know, vulnerability being announced. So you get back to the first point of you have to keep your code up to date or you will be exploited also. Um, so the second example is uh, something that hopefully you will never see in a Drupal contributed module, though I have once or twice. <laughs> Seen something like this where someone thought it would be clever to write a PHP shell into their module where you could just write whatever PHP you wanted, and maybe they didn't actually secure it very well. Um, but this is also something that you commonly see if you have a uh, file upload vulnerability, and the attacker is able to upload what's called a, uh, like a uh, PHP shell. Uh, so basically, they upload a file, and if they're able to execute that file, then they can run other PHP on your server. Uh, so this is a... a basically a second level exploit a lot of people would try. So um, Drupal does try to protect you from some of those uh, file upload vulnerabilities, but depending on your server configuration, Drupal may not be able to save you. Uh, and so something like this could happen where the attacker is able to upload a file. That file you see will take some post data and then translate the post data and eval it as PHP. And then again, the user can do essentially anything they want on, on your server as the PHP user. So again, this is you know, injection, the worst possible thing. Use the database API correctly. Uh, avoid evaling code in your modules. Um, fortunately, we rarely see this in Drupal. So this, this 2014 one was kind of a once in a decade level severity uh, vulnerability for Drupal. Um, 
Okay, so number two OWASP oh, 10 is when people have problems with authentication and sessions. So this means, you know, somehow someone is able to bypass the authentication system and be logged in when not supposed to, or they're able to steal a session uh, and uh, get their browser to essentially uh, get them logged into the site without knowing the password. Um, so this is an area where we don't see problems too often with Drupal. Uh, if you use Drupal cores uh, built in user handling, uh, these things are, are generally not a problem, but Drupal doesn't uh, provide any uh, enforcement of password policy out of the box. So you guys have probably run into this, right? You can have an administrator who picks a one letter password if, if they feel that's the thing for them to do. Um, so especially for site administrators, people who uh, can you know, enable modules or change the site configuration, you should definitely think about adding on some kind of password policy or writing <coughs> a simple version yourself where you just say, you know, your password has to be at least 10 characters long if you're a site administrator, if you have that role. Um, or this password policy module is already written, you know, you can bas basically just configure that. Uh, Two-factor authentication, hopefully people are familiar with this more and more. You know, so Gmail offers this an option, GitHub offers this an option. Uh, there's a, a module, a TFA module for Drupal that basically uses the same mechanism. So you can use Google Authenticator and you can basically force your administrators based on the role to have to set up two-factor authentication to log into the site. And so you can basically have the best of both worlds because you don't have to bother your less privileged users, remember, because you only gave the users uh, the privileges they needed to do their job. So your editors, your regular site users shouldn't be able to reconfigure the site. So you don't necessarily need to force them to go through two-factor authentication. But the you know, site admins who have full control of the site, you probably want to be much more careful about who's logging in as those administrators in case they picked a bad password or it got stolen. Um, so I would definitely recommend this. Uh, password storage, a lot of bespoke web applications have problems and don't do this correctly. Drupal core um, uh, does cover this. Uh, I'll mention that later also. Um, and then session IDs. So if, uh, if you're on basically like a cafe Wi-Fi uh, and you log into a site that doesn't use HTTPS, um, an attacker who's also sitting at the cafe can actually see that web request go by and they can see the headers in that web request and they can pick out your session ID. They can put it in their browser as a cookie and they're logged in as you. So this is a, you know, a very serious problem um, and it's easy to avoid if you serve your website over HTTPS. Um, the, really the best practice is to do it all over H HTTPS now and Google will actually give you a, bur a boost in your search result ranking if your site is all HTTPS, so there's a little extra, you know, reason to convince someone who's not convinced. Um, if you, for some reason, need to serve, for example, anonymous users still over HTTP, uh, again, there's, you know, Contrib has many modules. The secure login module will basically switch the users to and force them to HTTPS once they log in. So, uh, good options there. Um, number three on the OWASP Pup 10, and one we're going to spend some time on is cross-site scripting. So this is the absolute most frequent vulnerability in Drupal, especially Drupal before Drupal 8. Um, probably half of all module vulnerabilities uh, would fall into this category. Um, and cross-site scripting sounds a little esoteric, but really what it means just is that the attacker uh, is able to, in some way, uh, inject JavaScript tags or some kind of object tags that runs code like JavaScript into your page content. Um, so there's a couple of different variants in that, but that's simply what it means. Um, and the way to protect against it is just that, again, that untrusted user data has to be sanitized, has to be escaped before it's printed out. Um, one reason why this is less severe than number one, which is injection, is that a site administrator has to interact with the site in some way for this attack to execute. So with injection, the attacker could directly go, directly execute their code uh, and take over your site. With cross-site scripting, you as the administrator, while you're logged in, in some way need to interact with the site. Um, but that's not necessarily very hard to do because uh, the attacker could just send you an email with a shortened link, let's say, and they said, hey, check out this picture of kittens. And you go click that link and it's actually a redirect, redirects you to your site, to the admin page where this JavaScript is waiting uh, to execute and take over your site. So uh, do not be fooled into thinking that it's hard to trick someone into visiting a page with a crafted URL where, which will actually JavaScript if that's possible. So the first example of cross-site scripting is what's called a reflected cross-site scripting attack. And it's reflected because it basically takes some input from the current request, in this case the, the query string, 
and prints it out onto the page. So it's basically the user's input, the query string reflected back through the browser content uh, to create the attack. Um, and in this case, again, you know, so the attacker would basically send you, let's say, a redirect link to a very long URL that basically has an entire JavaScript snippet uh, in the query string. If you visit that, depending on your browser, um, it would actually execute that JavaScript and uh, could take over your site. Uh, a lot of times people use uh, this snippet at the bottom as a penetration test. So they will go through their forms, either manually or automatically, and put in this kind of uh, script tag into each form, into each possible user input, and then look to see if there's a JavaScript pop-up uh, in the page afterwards. And that's a great way to alert yourself to a problem, uh, but people often equate that probe with the actual attack. And the probe is harmless, but the attack uh, can be devastating. Um, so uh, you know, don't be fooled in thinking that cross-site scripting means a pop-up. A pop-up is just a way to find those vulnerabilities before the attacker finds them. Um, so in contrast to reflected cross-site scripting, we have persistent cross-site scripting. Um, so that's where the attacker's JavaScript is actually stored in your database. Most typically, it's the node title, the node body, some field on content that you allow, a comment title, something that you allow site visitors to enter. Um, and in this case, we see an example where we're doing something that looks like it ought to be safe, right? We're loading a node. We're creating an array of rows of the node, node ID and the node title. And then we're sending it through a theme function. Uh, that should, that's safe, right? It's, it's not obvious here that you see the vulnerability, right, at the first glance. If you just saw that code snippet, it wouldn't necessarily scream at you the way that SQL injection one did. Uh, but this is not actually safe because theme table doesn't do any escaping of the data for you. Um, so if you want to be safe, you actually have to go ahead and call check plain uh, or the equivalent of Drupal 8 on each of those node titles. Um, if you don't, the user in input, the node title, is printed without escaping. The user can store script tags in the node title, and when you visit that node, uh, that script will execute in the browser. Um, so there's a handbook page uh, here on Drupal.org about handling text securely, uh, which basically describes uh, the different functions you can use, like check plane to escape text. Uh, but we also have um, a table I'll get to uh, to run through. But again, I want to emphasize this cross-site scripting. Again, it's the number one vulnerability we see in Drupal, and it is really, really dangerous. Uh, as I said, people think that a pop-up is cross-site scripting. But in fact, cross-site scripting can do anything that your user account can do while you're logged in. Um, and this link here has a video showing an attack on a Drupal 6 site um, where the cross-site scripting attack basically goes ahead, changes the admin password, you, uh, changes the site name, takes the site offline, um, uh, changes the admin's email, and then logs them out so they can't get back into the site. So again, you know, that's the kind of thing you can do with a cross-site scripting attack. Um, so don't, again, don't, don't, Equate it with that pop-up. Equate it with JavaScript, arbitrary JavaScript doing things on your site. Um, so the golden rule when handling this output, and I mentioned this before, is we filter on output. Um, and that's very important from the perspective of users coming to your site. And they want to type something into the comment form, the node form, right, and save it. And then they might want to edit it later. And when they go to edit it, they don't want to see mangled uh, escaped HTML tags, they want to see exactly the same thing they typed so they can fix it and edit it, save it again, right? So the golden rule is that we store the user's input exactly as they type it, but we have to know that that user input is not trusted, and then when we output it, uh, we have to escape it. So again, you know, this escaping or any kind of conversion is performed on output. On input, we accept what the user types exactly, and we store it for them. Um, so that's... You'll see that principle throughout Drupal. People often wonder, like, why don't we escape on input? Why, why do we ever let this bad content go into our database? But again, it's like all user input must be untrusted. Uh, therefore, we must filter all user input when we display it. Um, and that means storing it as typed and then filtering it on output. OK, so here's kind of the hierarchy of escaping text um, and a link that shows a version of this also. And so you might think the safest text, if you know that it's something as a URL, you can escape it specifically as a URL. You can make sure it has a valid protocol, that it's formatted correctly. Um, so there's a check URL function. Uh, there's a check plain function I already mentioned. That will basically escape all HTML tags uh, and present them. That's kind of what you might use also on like a code snippet where you want to see everything uh, as it's sort of pre-formatted, uh, the actual HTML tags, and, and not have them execute in the page. Um, check markup is what we use 
with, uh, for example, a text format. So Check Markup needs to know what text format to apply to the text. And so, in fact, Check Markup may or may not actually fully sanitize uh, the output. So you have to be careful and know what text formats you've allowed your users to use. If you allow your users to use the full HTML format, that doesn't escape anything. That's the same thing as giving them permission to store and execute cross-site scripting attacks against you. So again, your editors, uh, you don't trust them fully. You should not have full HTML. They should have a filtered format that strips out script tags and other uh, risky tags. Um, uh, if you don't know what user is going to be typing in the text or you don't know, you don't have access to a particular text format to filter against, uh, there's a filter XSS and filter admin XSS functions, and you can use those basically just to arbitrarily allow or deny a list of HTML tags. Filter XSS admin is used basically in admin areas where the only thing we want to block is things like scripted and object tags, and we'll let everything else through. Um, and finally, in very rare cases, you, want to, you can trust the text. An example where we trust text is the node ID in that previous slide. So node ID we know is coming from the database. It has to be an integer. It, it's simply impossible in any reasonable case for it to be an attack. It's not user input. It's system-generated integers. So we trust that. We can just print it out. We don't have to go through the trouble of escaping it. Um, OK, so what does Drupal core do, a, do for us in terms of mitigating cross-site scripting? Um, so obviously, you, you have to be careful when you're coding. Drupal core does a few things also. Uh, one of the nice things it does, uh, since some version of Drupal 6, I think, um, certainly Drupal 7, is it restricts the session cookie uh, so that the session cookie cannot be accessed by JavaScript. And a, in earlier versions of Drupal and in older web applications, it was a very common attack that the attacker would actually use the JavaScript to, to copy the session cookie out and then send it to the attacker uh, through some web request. And that meant the attacker could then just enter that session cookie in their browser and be logged in as you to the site. Um, so that, fortunately, is not um, possible anymore, basically. Um, the user edit form uh, since Drupal 7 requires the current user to enter their password in order to change their password or email. So this is a, a protection. It protects against cross-site scripting, also protects <laughs> against you walking away from your computer at a coffee shop and not, not locking the screen um, so that someone can't just walk up and type in a new password for your account or a new email address. Um, there's a caveat here that administrators, while their own password cannot be changed, can change someone else's password or roles. Uh, so this is just a partial mitigation, uh, not a complete mitigation. Uh, you can ask me in the question section why that's that, the way it is. Um, again, I mentioned text formats and giving people the least privilege they need. So your editors uh, should have a text format that strips out dangerous HTML tags. Maybe for the rare cases where uh, someone needs you know, a full HTML access, your site administrators could do that. But it should generally be um, blocked, and it should be you know, hierarchical. So you give the format with the most permissions to the most trusted users. Um, the final thing that we're sort of moving towards uh, with Drupal but is not yet um, implemented in Drupal core, though it is uh, relatively it is possible to do with it Drupal 8 without too many hacks, is uh, content security policy. So content security policy is a new standard, uh, relatively new, supported by pretty much all browsers. Um, and basically, it's a set of headers that you uh, configure your site to send. And those headers can do things like say, there is no inline JavaScript on this page, so do not execute any. Um, and if your browser respects that header, if an attacker managed to get that reflected or stored cross-site scripting into your site, the browser would just say, well, you've told me that there is no inline JavaScript, so I'm just going to ignore this attack and not execute it at all. So this is a great possibility. There is um, a SecKit module I'll link to at the end, uh, which you can add on to your site. Uh, but there are some, some, it's harder to implement this in Drupal 7 because Drupal 7 actually has inline JavaScript for things like Drupal settings. In Drupal 8, we removed all of the inline JavaScript so you can more easily implement these kind of policies in Drupal 8. Um, and regardless, not all browsers respect these, or there could be a browser bug that allows the attacker to bypass them. So we still need to keep those principles of always escaping the user input. You know, use check plane, use filter XSS whenever you have user input. OK. Um, a wasp pop 10 number four is sort of uh, one that doesn't happen too often in Drupal, uh, insecure direct object references. And this is basically just there's a way to type in a URL that loads some data the user shouldn't have access to. 
you know, don't do that. Uh, basically, if you use access checks, use uh, access callbacks in the Drupal 7 menu system, the Drupal 8 routing system, in general, uh, unless you make a mistake in writing that, uh, you'll be protected from that. Um, OWASP up 10 number five is security misconfiguration. And this is sort of a catch-all topic. I don't really like it, but we'll, we'll cover a couple points here. Um, so one example of a common misconfiguration of, in Drupal sites is having error reporting turned on in production. And now that might not seem like a severe thing, but it actually allows attackers often to figure out the actual path on disk to your Drupal site on the server, and that can help them carry out other exploits. It may show them SQL errors, and if they see an SQL error, they can figure out, for example, which database server you're running, maybe even which version of the database server you're running. Um, and it may give them clues if they're trying to execute S SQL injection when they're getting warm or cold uh, by w seeing whether they are able to trigger an error. Um, so turn off error reporting uh, you know, for non-admin users. Uh, if you're using Drupal 7, uh, strongly recommend you disable uh, or even delete from the code base the PHP filter module. Uh, this, in earlier versions of Drupal, was used very often for little snippets of code to configure the site. Uh, in current versions of Drupal, you should keep that code in your code base under version control and don't use this module at all. That's it's not really any, any good things about it. Um, another common security misconfiguration and something that's actually hard to avoid sometimes on cheap shared hosting is that the PHP process has access to write its own files. So Drupal can overwrite the Drupal files. Uh, some projects think this is an advantage uh, because you can have auto-updating sites. But if you can have an auto-updating site, that also means the attacker, potentially, can write their code over top of your site's code and take over uh, that site or server. Uh, so we strongly recommend for Drupal that you do not configure it that way. Um, and a best practice example here, you can see uh, the U Unix users and permissions is that we have a separate Unix user who's responsible for checking out and deploying the, the site code. And that Unix user is different than the web server user. So a typical uh, Linux web server user is data, right? So data can read all these files but cannot write the files, except, of course, for the upload directory where you have to basically invert the logic and allow the web server that one place to upload the user's files, um, but your deployer may need to read things there also. Um, handbook page on drupal.org, security, secure configuration, uh, talks about a bunch of these uh, issues. So please do look at drupal.org. There's a lot of great security documentation there in the handbook. Um, and will help you avoid these common mistakes. Um, last couple things here. Um, again, we talked about principle of least privilege. Who do you want to have access to enable, disable modules, reconfigure the site? Uh, make sure that those permissions are not given out to roles uh, where people have the roles and you don't fully trust them. As again, same for text formats. Full HTML means I give you permission to execute cross-site scripting against me. If do you trust the person that much, you want them to execute arbitrary JavaScript against you? If yes, give them this full HTML. If no, then you should be giving them a more restrictive text format. Um, best practice, don't use user one account in your daily work. In fact, even I would recommend blocking it. Uh, have every site administrator have their own login, have them all, their own passwords that are distinct. Um, and you can also you know, change the user one login to something other than admin, something that people can't guess as readily if you don't block it. Um, one other common thing we see is that people put their private files under their document root. So if you're setting up a server, you want to make sure your private files are outside the document root. You can see here where index.php is. That's where Drupal serves web requests, everything under that. And we want to put the private files directory at the same level or above. So there is no possibility you can make a direct web request and access one of those private files. Uh, so people, you know, make mistakes in their server configuration. They think they blocked access to the private files directory, uh, but if it's under the doc root, if they made a mistake in that server configuration, the hacker can come in and directly read those files out through the web server. Uh, so again, um, another thing that you might want to have outside of your document root is any kind of configuration or any kind of files, let's say, containing API keys. You might have a configuration directory that's shown here on the on the diagram, and again, keep that outside the document root. So even if you make a terrible mistake in your web server configuration, there's basically no possibility that the attacker can directly read those files out of the file system and display them. A um, little more on uh, secure configuration. So PHP file execution, 
Um, Drupal, basically every single request hits index.php. And then on normal requests, there's no other PHP file that runs. Uh, so you can actually basically block access to every other PHP file in the Drupal file hierarchy. And that gives you a little more defense and depth against someone uh, uploading a PHP file and trying to execute it. Uh, so Drupal uh, 8 actually comes with this baked into the, the HTTP access file. And you can add a rule to your web server like shown here to help protect your Drupal 7 or before sites. Uh, you know, there's a few cases where people have something else, like they have an analytic script uh, in a subdirectory that they do need to make PHP calls to. Um, but you can definitely, you know, you can whitelist those specific scripts and just don't allow arbitrary PHP files to be accessed. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about before turning over to Mosh um, is sensitive data exposure, OWASP top 10 number 6. Um, so if you are handling sensitive data in your database, such as credit card numbers, you really probably should be encrypting them. Uh, same with people's medical records uh, or their personal, uh, other personal information. Uh, you need to encrypt those, make sure if there's a database backup somewhere that someone gets access to, they can't actually read out that raw data. But even better than encryption is don't ever have that data. Don't ever have someone's credit card number if you can avoid it. There are a lot of... Um, services now where you can integrate with them and all you will ever get is a payment token, your web server will never actually get the credit card number and that's a lot more secure for you. It's a lot less liability for you. It's a lot easier to be compliant with the PCI requirements. Uh, same thing for things like medical records. You, know, you should, and other personal information, you know, you should make really, really sure that you need that information before you ever store it into your Drupal database. And then if you do have to store it, you know, figure out how you're encrypting maybe your data backups, you need to make sure that if you're giving developers copies of the database, that you've scrubbed that information out before the developers ever see it and before they put it on their laptop because developer has a copy of the database dump on their laptop, the laptop's stolen, now someone has all the credit card numbers or all the health records, and that's a big problem. Um, uh, another way sensitive data is exposed, of course, is through web traffic. We talked about, you know, sitting in the cafe, someone reads your web requests. Uh, maybe that web request, the response contains, again, someone's medical record. Now the other guy in the cafe just got a medical record of one of your clients. Uh, if the client finds out, they're probably gonna sue you. So don't do that. You Again, set your site up, use HTTPS. Uh, we talked about passwords being properly hashed. Uh, Drupal takes care of this for you. Since Drupal 7, if you're still using a Drupal 6 or even Drupal 5 site, there's a PHP, PHPass module will enable a stronger password storage. Uh, so I recommend turning those on for your site. Now I will give it to Moshe here. Okay, thanks, Peter. All right, I want to uh, apologize for being late at the beginning here. I hope there wasn't too much drama. I, no. I missed it if there was. Okay. Um, we're going to keep going. OWASP number seven. Um, missing function level access control. Um, here we have an example of hook menu, um, which applies to Drupal 7 and before. Um, and the last element there is called access callback, and the value is true. All right, uh, that is occasionally the right thing to do, um, but we're saying it's not in this example. Um, here's probably what you meant to say, um, access arguments, and the value is administer my module. All right, so now uh, this page, admin my module settings, is properly protected by a permissions check. All right, so this OWASP thing is like uh, actually use the access control that your framework provides. Um, Definitely a good idea. Uh, similarly, um, we have access control on listings of entities in Drupal. Um, and you'll see halfway down here the add tag node access. Um, that is what triggers the node access control to add its SQL conditions um, and to restrict access for people who don't have the right grants. Um, so that's required anytime you're doing a listing in Drupal. Um, if you're all the way back at 6.x, um, look at the DB rewrite SQL function, okay? Uh, number eight is cross-site request forgery. This is kind of a cool attack. Um, what we have here in this example is, um, what happened? It's back. I think it was a, a power thing. Um, okay, so, um, yes, this one. Uh, Okay, so um, we're deleting a pair of pants in this example. Um, 
We are taking the second argument. Um, you can see page arguments in the first array, um, and the value is two. Um, so the ID of the pants is getting passed to the uh, my module delete pants function, um, and that ID is getting um, that that pant is getting deleted by ID in the second function there. Um, so if someone can trick you to go into this page, then um, you have just deleted a pair of pants. Um, so the way this attack really works is that uh, oftentimes an image that is posted somewhere on the web and you are encouraged to visit this page, um, the image, instead of actually pointing to the cat image on disk somewhere, will point to the pants deletion page, all right, which is pants1337 delete in this example. Um, so the admin visits what he wants to visit, which is the cat image, doesn't get the cat image, instead makes a request back to his own site. Um, his browser um, will go request um, pants1337 delete. He's logged into his own site. He has the proper permissions to visit that page. And now the attacker has caused a write operation in the database. Okay, So that's cross-site request forgery. Uh, we say forgery, I think, because you had no intention of visiting that pants deletion page. Uh, someone tricked you to doing so and took advantage of the fact that you're logged in and privileged there. Sure. Yes, yeah, so the question was, can you make a post request request site request forgery? And you definitely can. The attacker just writes a little JavaScript snippet, and the JavaScript snippet can uh, make a post. Or the attacker sets up a form on their site, and the action of the form points to your site. You submit the form, and the post request goes to your site and takes. So post is not a protection against this. Um, that's why Drupal forms have a, a form token that protects against it. Exactly. So um, the, the way to mitigate this kind of attack or prevent it on your site is to always use the form API. Um, when you're doing forms on your Drupal site, don't write just plain HTML form elements. Um, definitely go through the trouble of using the form API. Uh, because that is what's going to check for a uh, token uh, and make sure that you haven't been um, tricked into visiting this um, URL. There are a few occasions when you want uh, just a link um, and not a form uh, to make it easier on the person who needs to do like an approval of a pending comment moderation or something like that. Um, in that case, your get request should have a token on it that will check to make sure um, the token was actually generated by Drupal and not by an attacker. Um, and the Drupal 8 routing system actually makes this super easy. So if um, you're using Drupal 8, you can do routes that check these tokens uh, just with the routing YML. Um, there's a link there for more information about CSRF. Um, OK, so uh, we now are building sites that depend on more than just Drupal. Um, Drupal itself has a nice update status system. Um, you can see a screenshot here of it. Um, it will tell you when you have a pending security update. Um, and I uh, just want to remind everyone that if you have other Componer, co Composer packages that your site depends on, those need to be checked as well. Okay? Um, the Composer outdated command is one thing you might want to look into to help you with that. Um, and there's also a project uh, that will flag um, your projects if they are behind on security updates. Uh, that one's in the Drupal-Composer organization on GitHub. OK, so uh, just a little bit more about the update status system in Drupal. Um, it will email you if you have stuff you need to do if your modules go out of date. Um, and it can tell you when they go out of date or only when they go out of security um, compliance. All right, so definitely turn that on. Um, if you aren't going to visit your site and look at that report all the time. Uh, and uh, number 10 on the OWASP top 10 are unvalidated redirects and forwards. So um, Drupal has this uh, Drupal go to function. We use it all the time after you submit a form um, and in other cases. Uh, and we just want to make sure that the value that gets passed to that has been, has been checked. Uh, and you're going to an internal URL and not some phishing site. Um, and so here you see an example for how to do it correctly. Um, the URL is external function. Um, and there's some equivalent in Drupal 8 uh, that I don't recall right now. Um, so just kind of summarizing again, um, the main uh, things to keep in mind, 
we don't want to trust user provided data, uh, whether it's coming from the URL or it's coming from the content that people are submitting in comments or in posts. Um, and um, the attackers are using all kinds of browser features against us in order to trick us to visit pages and delete pants and all that sort of thing. Um, and keep your sites up to date with code and that kind of um, thing. So uh, some tips for being prepared before there's an attack. Um, we want to put our code in version control. Um, if it's not in ver version control, you could visit your site one day and attacker has not only owned your data, but has deleted the code and you know now you don't have code or data and uh, maybe not a job either. So <laughs> um, you definitely don't want to let that happen. Um, you need to make full backups. You need to have separate logins for each admin. Um, and uh, you guys can see the rest of the uh, bullet points here. Um, if you do happen to get attacked, it does happen. OK. Um, here's a quick list of uh, what you should do. Um, you'll find longer lists on the internet. Um, but uh, maybe become familiar with this, and that will motivate you to not become a person in this situation, um, because you're going to go through this list in a very unhappy state. Um, and you know some of these bullet points are like save and scan all your logs for traces of the attack, um, and that sums up you know weeks of work uh, in one bullet point. So um, this is ju just a word of caution here. Um, Want to put another pitch for a few modules on Drupal.org that are really helpful for security. Um, Peter mentioned a couple of these. Security review is like a checklist module. Um, Paranoia is a great uh, module that will disable um, things that you probably shouldn't have it enabled on your site. Um, and SecKit um, right here for Connect security policy. Uh, you know, a lot of the examples here are still uh, Drupal 7 focused. Um, that's deliberate. Um, we have very few Drupal 8 sites in the wild compared to Drupal 7. Um, so at least for a security talk, we want to still be talking about the sites that people are running and using. Um, we made a lot of improvements in the five years that we were developing Drupal 8. Um, and you can just see a list of them here. Twig auto escape is huge um, for getting rid of those XSS vulnerabilities that Peter emphasized earlier. Um, and the HT access is better for um, executing PHP and subfolders and so forth and so on. So um, we touched on these. Uh, Drupal 8 is a more secure platform. I hope you guys are starting to use it. Um, a special um, farewell to the PHP module, which is gone in, uh, in Drupal 8. Um, you'll m be missed not by us, but by the attackers. Um, and uh, if you do um, have security questions, um, definitely become familiar with the Drupal security team. There's their URL right there. You can read about what they do. Um, it's an all-volunteer um, force that is looking after thousands and thousands of contrib modules um, and putting out you know, essays, security advisories on them. Um, so if you come across a security team member, please give them a hug and say thank you. Um, and Are you asking for a hug? No, no, <laughs> I am not. Maybe Peter is, um, but uh, they, they do a lot of work for free, so um, provide a great service to Drupal. Happy is also on the security team. Is there anyone else in the room? A few others at the conference. Um, all the core committers obviously are on the security team also, so they can coordinate Drupal core. Um, but you, if you go to security.drupal.org, everyone who has a Drupal.org account can be logged in and can submit issues there. So if you come across uh, a security issue, if you go to a project page on Drupal.org, there's a direct link that takes you to the security site to submit any security problems you find so that they can re remain private until we decide if it needs to be resolved mm -hmm. uh, privately or if it can be public. Um, you can also, on that site, even if you can't see anything else, you can see the official list of Drupal security team members. So if someone sends you an email saying, hey, I'm on the security team and you need to you know, give me access to your site, um, <laughs> at very least make sure they're officially on the list, but uh, trust us, we won't ever do that. Yeah, that's not, <laughs> not something we do. As I said at the beginning, basically we, we're, we respond to your reports. So we count on the community 
to look at the code, find the vulnerabilities, report them to security.drupal.org, and then we coordinate with the maintainers of the modules or with the core maintainers to fix the problems. So we can open it up for questions and comments and discussion. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, right. It, I think there's a microphone. Probably, if for the recording, we should try to use the microphone. Uh, do you think that exposing Drupal version is a security problem? Uh, yeah, so the question was, what, is, is exposing the version of Drupal that you're running a security problem? The security team is taking the position that that is not a problem. Um, it's not in our top 50 problems. Is that <laughs> yeah. accurate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways you can discover what version people are running. So yeah, we, we generally slightly scoff at people that recommend, let's say, deleting the changelog file so no one can see what your current version is. Well, I would say you would be better off just being up to date rather than trying to hide the information about the fact that you're out of date. Um, um, Drupal 7 and 8, I mean, if you look at the headers, will at least tell you that you're running Drupal 7 or Drupal 8 in, right in the headers by default. And yeah, there's plenty of ways to see. So I, I don't think hiding the fact that you're running Drupal is, is very important. Right. Again, keeping up to date is the important thing. Other questions? Yeah. Um, regarding internal systems, I intranets and, and so on, you know, I've seen that uh, self-signed certificates uh, Still uh, uh, widely used. What priority would you give uh, fixing them, and what uh, what do you think about it actually? Uh, so an interesting question about uh, HTTPS, and if I'm using uh, internal site with self-signed certificates, which means basically with a self-signed certificate, the, the encryption still happens, but your browser is not able to determine whether this is a legitimate site. Um, so. Uh, if you kind of tell your browser, ignore all those warnings, I want to go there anyway, uh, someone might redirect you. Let's say there was an open redirect attack. Uh, maybe we should talk about that a little more. So an open redirect attack would be you think you're going to a site, um, and the attacker has constructed a, a query string that causes a redirect, and you end up landing on the attacker's site, and the domain is almost the same, maybe one letter off. The login form looks the same. Now you, and you're ignoring your browser warning about an invalid certificate, uh, so they tricked you that way too, and you type in your username and password, hit submit, and they say, great, now I have your username and password, I'll send you back to your site to log in. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think it's, it's part of that defense and depth strategy that if you are, you know, always accepting these invalid certificates, it means you've eliminated one of your defenses uh, in, this, in the stack. So I wouldn't recommend it, but, you know, it's a, a trade-off. Someone else had a question, yeah? If you, if you can, yeah. <laughs> Does it work? Yeah. Oh. Um, so what I find difficult sometimes is how do you know if Drupal's API and the functions are already handling the security side of it? Because when I'm theming, like in views and load templates and stuff, it's, I, I never know whether it's already help sanitizing it or whether I need to re-sanitize it. Like sometimes I just do the functions just in case. Okay, so that's a great question. Um, so the situation is kind of different between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Um, uh, so, and before, uh, so in Drupal 7, in theory, the variables should be sanitized before in the pre-process functions in the theme, but I agree, they're not always sanitized. So especially if you're using some variables from a contributed module, it's hard to know. Yeah, you have to either run it again and look for double escaping, um, or talk to the person who developed that particular theme call and ask them. Uh, in principle, it should be in Drupal 8, we have a stronger guarantee. So the Twig templates, we have auto escaping turned on, which means that if it wasn't uh, basically sanitized beforehand, it will automatically be sanitized when it's printed. So that's one of the, I think, great things about Drupal 8 for front end developers is that that auto escaping relieves that entire stress about whether this has been sanitized or not. And you can just go ahead and write your templates. <laughs> so just to comment on that, I was talking to an agency earlier, actually this week, and they were saying that one of the things that they do is they put in sample data when they're developing a site uh, that includes cross-site scripting attacks in the header, like all over the place. Um, so only useful at a certain stage in development, but then you would see it if it 
came up. So it's I thought it was a pretty cool too. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. You said no configuration should be in doc root. What about settings PHP with the database configuration in it? Yeah. Um, since it's a PHP file, it's pretty poor configuration for you to expose the whole source code of your site from regular web requests. It happened to Facebook, so it can happen to anyone for a few minutes. Um, but it's, I, I wouldn't consider that like a real serious problem to move that out of the doc root. I don't know if you have the same opinion. Um, well, I'd say one thing you can do, and we actually recommend this in some of the uh, help comments in settings PHP is you can actually, you can include another file in settings.php and you can store that file outside of the doc root. Mm -hmm. So if, if you do have, let's say in production, very sensitive credentials, uh, you, and you want to make sure they're never accidentally committed, or you may want to make sure they're never exposed to a web request, I would put those in an include file outside your doc root and then load them that way. And that, that gives you a little bit extra defense and depth. Yeah. And I guess the, uh, the other variant on that is that um, you can read from environment variables um, your database credentials, and then they're never on the file system at all. Yeah. I believe that Pantheon takes that approach, which is great. Thanks. So if uh, you are not already planning to attend, please do come on Friday. Uh, contribution sprints are really a lot of fun. Uh, if you haven't done it before, there will be mentors there. Uh, you can find like-minded people to work on contributed modules, uh, talk about themes. Um, uh, also, we appreciate your feedback on these sessions. The session slides are already posted as a PDF. So if you want to review, you want to go to those links, uh, review the content, uh, please look at the PDF. This, w this recording will be live, I think, with, uh, within a day. Um, but also go to the session note and please give us feedback. Uh, rate us, give us comments if there's anything we could improve for next time. As I said, we're doing this kind of as a service to the community, help improve everyone's uh, security awareness. Uh, so we would appreciate your feedback if you have any improvements we could make. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't here at the beginning. That's all right. It was kind of funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the What's a good thing that was in the first half? Yes. <laughs> really good thing. I have a question. How can I download the board for you?